They came from all around the world, some fleeing religious and political persecution, others economic hardship in search of opportunity and a better future for their children. It all began at Fort Snelling, originally Fort St. Anthony, which was built on the Bedote. This was a strategic piece of Dakota land where the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers merge. It was granted to the U.S. military in a controversial treaty negotiated by Lieutenant Zebulon Pike. You might recognize his name from Pike's Peak. Construction on the fort began in 1819 and was operational by 1825. It was intended to keep the British from any further incursions into the Northwest Territory and to secure U.S. control of the booming fur trade at the time. Fort St. Anthony became a hub on the western frontier. At the time, it was intended for trade, for military security, for protection and intervention amidst native squabbles amongst the Dakota and the Jibwe, and for economic exploitation of the vast natural resources in the area. The cavalry officers eventually banned whiskey distillers from their land, so one retired French-Canadian fur trader slash bootlegger named Pierre Pigsai Perron moved five miles downriver in 1838 and set up shop. An 1837 treaty with the Native Americans secured the area for white settlement. It's worth noting, I think, that the very first grant of asylum in the U.S. territory occurred in 1621 when Chief Massasoit, leader of the indigenous Wampanoag tribe, entered into a treaty with the Plymouth colonists fleeing religious persecution in England. He granted them safety as well as living space. So meanwhile, back in St. Paul, the area became known as Loué de Cochon, or French for pig's eye. We're standing here overlooking the Mississippi River as it flows through downtown St. Paul. And we're looking at the train tracks that lead us to Central Station, right over there. And just up the river is Fort Snelling, originally Fort St. Anthony. It wasn't until in 1841 that a French priest, Father Lucien Galtier, built a log chapel dedicated to St. Paul the Apostle and renamed the city St. Paul. If you didn't know better, you might think that we're no longer in St. Paul, but rather somewhere up in the North Woods. But not the case. We're about a mile and a half from Union Depot in St. Paul, right off the riverfront. So this place where we're standing is called Swede Hollow. Euro-American use of Swede Hollow dates as far back as 1839, just a couple of years after Pig's Eye Perron moved downstream to start up his distillery. It was when resident Edward Phelan, you might recognize that name, Phelan, he built a, a small cabin up on the spot where the Hams Brewery is right now. Its birth as a community is attributed to trappers and lumbermen and other laborers who built hovels in the area, taking advantage of the ravine and the landscape to remain comfortable in the winter as well as cool in the summer. What immigrants did is they would walk along the railroad tracks from Union Depot to Swede Hollow upon their arrival in St. Paul. Sometimes they would just have notes pinned to their shirts in order for residents to identify them and where they were from and what language they spoke, and then they would direct them toward family members or people who spoke their language, and then they would move in and be welcomed by those people as they got settled in their new home. Others moved into the first vacant house that they could find. Throughout its history, the hollow was a melting pot of nationalities. It was home to waves of immigrants descending upon this last city of the East. That's how Minneapolis and St. Paul came to be thought of early in their existence. Westbound settlers trying to establish new lives, beginning with the French and the French-Canadian fur trappers, then the German, the Swedish, the Irish, the Austro-Hungarian, the Polish, the Italian, and finally the Mexican immigrants in the 1950s. And this location, if we were to imagine ourselves back 150 years, was a neighborhood filled with homes and kids playing 
people fishing up in a pond up north of us, a neighborhood filled with multiple languages and people from different ethnic backgrounds and countries. In fact, it looked like these pictures back when Sweet Hollow still had immigrant residents living there. As we make our way into the park, you can look around and in places you can see the remnants of the buildings and the houses that used to be here. There was a spring-fed creek that ran down through the middle of it and gathered in a pool here at the bottom. While the names of the residents changed, the spirit of community remained. Swede Hollow gave immigrants a chance to transition into American society together while retaining the values and traditions of their homelands. If Swede Hollow existed today, it might have welcomed the Hmong, Liberian, Ethiopian, the Somali, and now the Karen, Kareni, Kachin, and even the Congolese. In the late 1850s, Swedish immigrants moved into the vacant structures and made a life for themselves in the area. They paid the city a small rental fee for the right to live in these modest shanties, and it became the first Swedish settlement in the city. A bare-bones place bisected by a spring water creek and teeming with single-story houses, the Swedes called their new home Svenska Dalen, or Swedish Dale. It would become more commonly known as Sweet Hollow. So what's the Bethel connection? It was in 1884 that Bethel's founder, John Alexis Edgren, moved his seminary from the University of Chicago to the first Swedish Baptist church in St. Paul. The Swedish Baptist church was established in 1849 and began meeting in the first Baptist church of St. Paul right down on Wakuda Avenue and 10th. It met there for a number of years in the basement of the first Baptist church, and that church, by the way, was also originated by Swedish missionaries. But this church, called the Swedish Baptist Church, wanted a church of their own. Many of them lived in Sweet Hollow, and they wanted to practice their faith in their own language, Swedish. So, for the first few years, it was named the Swedish Baptist Church, or the Fjorste Svenska Baptist Church, the First Swedish Baptist Church. They met in the basement of the First Baptist Church in St. Paul until they could build a building of their own, eventually constructing a permanent church up on, alongside Payne Avenue and Sims. I love that connection between Bethel and John Alexis Edgren establishing, establishing his seminary in a church that housed some of the first Swedish immigrants that lived in Sweet Hollow. So why did the immigrants come here? The answer is, frankly, there was work. Immigrant labor was needed in this last city of the East. People worked in lumber, mining, flour milling, fur trade, railroad and shipping. In the area of flour milling, Minneapolis had 18 mills at the peak of the industry, making it the lar largest flour producer in the nation. In railroads, we were the headquarters of several railroads, including BNSF, Great Northern, Northern Pacific, and the Milwaukee Short Line. And of course, there's brewing. We were home to hams, Schmidt, Grain Belt, and still shells. And of course, mining. Most of you think of 3M as a technology company, but the 3Ms stand for Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. So there was a lot of work here in the cities and in St. Paul. So many of the immigrants took jobs in the milling and brewing industries just at the top of the hill. Those companies looked to the hollow for unskilled and semi-skilled labor. Immigrants also worked for the railroads and streetcar lines, and when they were financially able, they left the hollow for life up on the street, up near Arlington Hills, adjacent to Payne Avenue. As a result, many families started in the hollow, expanded there, and moved away. And they were then replaced by new families that hoped to do the same. The homes were generally not owned in the hollow, so empty ones were used by new residents. Phelan Creek, the creek that ran through the valley, was important to life in the hollow. It provided water for small gardens, washing clothes, and carrying waste into the Mississippi River below. You'll notice on these pictures 
that there are outhouses built on stilts above the creek and adjacent to the creek, and those were the bathrooms. Considerations for a sewage system were thought about in the early 1900s after the city health department received numerous complaints about the odor emanating from the area. But the cost was seen as prohibitive, and so those, those plans were scrapped. For all of its problems, though, in the eyes of the outsiders, the community lined with outhouses was home to the people who lived there. Residents rarely lacked for necessities, and a sense of togetherness prevailed. Children played baseball and fished for northern pike and crappie in the pool that was beneath the, bre the brewery. After World War II, the city of St. Paul, like cities throughout the United States, began to take steps to modernize. Officials longed to remove blight and improve living standards in their city. The hollow, still nothing more than a collection of shacks, was deemed an unsafe place to live, and so that the area that had supported the poorest immigrants was soon under threat. The absence of proper heating and plumbing, as well as the contaminated water supply, were the last straw. The city's health department worried about living conditions in the area and deemed the hollow a health hazard and forced the 16 families living there to move out. On December 11, 1956, the 13 houses still standing were burned to the ground by the fire department. The neighborhood of Sweet Hollow was no more. Twenty years later, the land was turned into a nature preserve by the city of St. Paul and is preserved as Sweet Hollow Park today. So most immigrants arrive in their new host culture with expectations of rebuilding personal and professional identities in similar social circumstances and even fields of employment to their countries of origin. But most of them are met with disrespect, discrimination, and a loss of social status and income. The fact is, unless you're Native American, we all have an immigration story. My own immigration story harkens back on one side, John Howland arrived in 1620 as an indentured servant to the first governor of Plymouth, John Carver. Carver was credited with drafting the Mayflower Compact and was its first signer. He died soon after the first difficult winter. Another ancestor of mine, William Ripley, came from Norwich, England, to Hingham, Massachusetts, on the ship Diligent in 1638. He married the daughter of William Bradford, then governor of Plymouth Colony, and eventually the Howland and Ripley sides were joined in marriage when Cynthia Bassett married Daniel Ripley. That's my story. You each have a story like that, unless, of course, you're Native American. So what are some of the fears that people have around immigration? One, people have economic fears. Most of the time, unjustified, but they fear that people will come in and take their jobs. But frankly, as is well documented, most immigrants don't have the educational background or the skill set to take high-paying jobs, so they usually begin with low-paying manual labor kinds of jobs. Secondly, cultural fears, identity fears. People are afraid of immigrant groups coming in and changing the composition of their society, the cultural values and beliefs of their society. And that's happened throughout times as groups have uh, immigrated to certain countries and lands and begun to mix with the local populations. Um, there certainly is going to be a change to the culture it's going to be a long-term change, though. It's going to take a long time to evolve and to play out. And then finally, there are personal safety fears, security fears. And this is, in part, um, an uneducated understanding of people and an unfamiliarity. People not being familiar with who these people are, what their backgrounds are. And so there's a fear of the unknown. And people take that as a safety threat. I hope understanding this place that has received so many waves of immigrants over the existence of our local community gives you some perspective, not only on your own journey and your own family's heritage and history, but on perhaps how we should be welcoming and receiving those who are still arriving in our community.